Hello, we'd like to welcome all of you to week four of our UCLA course on nonviolence and social movements featuring Reverend James Lawson Jr. And tonight's conversation will focus on the issue of the Montgomery bus boycott, a historic event that not only uh, transformed uh, US history, that uh, gave birth to the freedom struggle uh, throughout the South and across the country, but also was a major introduction of the philosophy of nonviolence to the US scene. And so I wanted to begin by just sharing a few slides of that historic campaign, and then we will commence with some of the questions about Reverend Lawson's reflections and his perspective on the Montgomery bus boycott. So um, this is the iconic photo of Rosa Parks uh, riding a bus in um, Montgomery. This is the um, shot of uh, Rosa Parks getting arrested uh, for violating the Jim Crow segregation policies that uh, required um, African Americans to give up their seat and to uh, go to the back of the bus. This is a young Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who was a um, minister in Montgomery in front of a um, public bus in that city. And this is a photo of Dr. King and um, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, who was also a minister in Montgomery, um, as he was about to get arrested for his leadership in the Montgomery bus boycott. And this is one of the uh, many protests that uh, emerged in Montgomery uh, in support of the bus boycott. And uh, this uh, uh, reflects the tremendous community support, the tremendous massive mobilization that continued month after month after month. So 381 now days, uh, Kent, 381 days from December 1st of December, December 1st, 1955 to about January 17th, 1957. So that's an extraordinary length of time, 381 days when there was a boycott of the public buses in Montgomery to uh, call national and international attention to the policies of Jim Crow, segregation, and the, um, uh, the legally enforced discrimination of um, African-Americans in Montgomery, uh, but throughout the country. And, uh, during that historic um, uh, Montgomery bus boycott, uh, you were working as a youth minister in India. So could you please tell me when you first learned about the Montgomery bus boycott? Well, I was a, I was a United Methodist Church missionary uh, to his, in uh, Nagpur, India, where I spent two years, uh, three years working and I was a uh, coach and phys ed teacher at Hislop College and coached uh, world soccer or fo world football <laughs> and uh, coached um, track and field and tennis and did a lot of introducing and coaching of basketball which there was a wild interest and Hislop College especially wanted to uh, expand its understanding of what um, one of the people told me was scientific coaching, <laughs> scientific physical ed. <laughs> so that was my, that was my work. So, um, I learned of the bus boycott there um, in early December of 1955 
And my first reaction was to stop. Uh, I was in my apartment. I picked up the morning newspaper on the side porch and it was on the front page of the Nagpur Times, um, which I read at my da desk. And my first reaction actually was to start a minor celebration. <laughs> so I got jumped back on my, up on my feet and more or less danced around my desk two or three times, uh, not doing a whooping, but uh, uh, yelling and uh, shouting for joy. Uh, um, and, and, and in actual fact, I'll tell the whole story. My next department neighbor was a biologist at Hislop College by the name of Chris Theophilus. And we'd become friends. And Chris was a young, young man like myself, married, had one or two small children. So Chris came running out of his front door to find out what was going on with me next door. <laughs> and I, I had a hard time telling Chris what it was about. But eventually, I got out the fact to him that this Montgomery bus boycott had taken place within the last two or three days, I'm sure and that this is something I had been expecting all along. That I did not know where, what it was going to be or where it was going to be, except that I knew it was going to happen. Because I said to him, I knew I'd, I'd been preparing myself to do nonviolent struggle, to learn it, to teach it, to practice it. And that I know now that when I go back, I will be in the midst of that struggle. That's amazing that you knew yeah. that this was going to happen. Uh, you may not have known where and when, yes. uh, but That's here right. you are in India, uh, learning about Gandhi, learning about uh, nonviolence, connecting with people who worked with Gandhi, and you saw and understood the significance and the impact of this from the first you read about it. Well, I became aware that we had to have a movement in the United States by 1952 after I'd spent about 13 months in federal prison, rejecting the selective service, of practicing my personal civil disobedience against selective service, for which I received a three years sentence of which I spent about 13 months. So by 50, I went back then and finished my first degree at Baldwin Wallace College then near the airport at in Cleveland, Ohio. And then I prepared immediately I, to go to India. So by 52, where I started, I started my study of Gandhi in 1947 as a freshman. I never took any formal co courses, but I read and for an example, I tried to find every book I could in the college library on Gandhi and read them in 47, 48, 49, um, and began to study nonviolence in Europe. During World War II, there were a number of major episodes of nonviolence, uh, especially around the resistance to the Nazi propaganda and the Nazi uh, picking up uh, in Europe some 26 million people and killing them in the Holocaust. Of that 26 odd million people, 6 million were Jewish people. And so I, I read about a lot of that um, and practiced nonviolence from a Jesus of Nazareth angle. Uh, I was fascinated by Gandhi I studied Gandhi in South Africa and then back in his homeland of India. So it was one of the reasons I decided it would be a good idea to go to India because then I could meet some of the people who worked with Gandhi, which I did, 
and could also spend some time in a couple of his ashrams, which were gathering places and retreat places where he lived um, for uh, most, of the, most of his adult years in India. He lived in these places that he established for himself as sort of uh, preparations for struggle uh, in the Indian scene, uh, living the life he expected to live uh, once the British uh, left uh, India. So it was a very, very special day. Um, that story I did tell to David Helberstan, who wrote the book, The Children. And The Children is David Helberstan's personal account of eight people uh, in the United States from 1960 on. He followed eight of us, including James Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, Gloria Johnson Powell, uh, Dorothy and myself. In that book, telling the story of the Nashville story and the preparation for it, and then taking us 25 years into our lives into the 90s. So a part of what uh, I've said already about the experience in India is in that book. He does, he does recount that story of my hearing of the, uh, my getting the reading of the first news of the Montgomery bus boycott. Thank you. And in the class that we have been teaching for many years mm -hmm. at uh, UCLA, you've always been uh, very uh, clear on the necessity of uh, understanding the global dimensions of nonviolence uh, from uh, uh, India to South Africa to opposition to uh, the rise of Nazism uh, in uh, Europe, uh, as well as other international models of nonviolent struggle over many generations. Um, but what really caught my attention is when you raised that, uh, that, that in your study, of nonviolence and Gandhiism, you knew that there would be uh, a, a nonviolent uh, emergence mm -hmm. in um, the United States. And that uh, uh, in many ways, the when you first learned about Montgomery bus boycott, mm -hmm. uh, you understood that- was a that confirmation. There was a confirmation of what you had believed- What I had been thinking about and knowing <laughs> that took place. So in a sense, it was a voice from God or a voice from history showing me that these things, it can happen that way. <laughs> and that maybe in many cases is not an accident. It, it takes place in the mind and the spirit long before it takes place in actuality. And I should, I should also say that, that um, one of the stories that impressed me a great deal in Europe was the resistance of teachers in Norway who were ordered after the occupation by the Germans, they were ordered then to teach Nazi theory about Aryan superiority and about the persecution that then of Jews and of others. And I think I have not read that account recently, but some 10,000 school teachers in Norway were forced into detention camps in the very cold northern part of Norway as punishment for their refusal to, uh, to teach the Nazi philosophy in their, public, in their school classes. And I learned from them the necessity of being prepared to stand in your conviction when indeed you would be suffering for it. You, you would, because they lived in very cold temperatures with not much food, with that much clothing or heat, but they somehow manage in large numbers to survive. There were some 10,000 of them who were in those places in the north, as I recall, but they would not yield 
to the thing that they saw as evil <laughs> and untrue, they would not teach. So I, I, I remember their heroism encouraged and recognized that this is, this is the kind of character that it would take to overcome the forces of racism in the United States. And that's another theme that I think has been very strong in this class mm -hmm. that uh, addresses how social movements inspire other social movements. Right. And that leaders of social movements gain knowledge um, from other social movements in the past and yeah. try to glean and try to draw lessons uh, mm -hmm. from those movements in the past. So I think that's another uh, strong link that um, mm -hmm. uh, addresses the global dimension of nonviolent movements and nonviolent struggle. Um, and even within the domestic context in the United States, how uh, the uh, movement of the 50s and 60s continues to inspire people to this day. Uh, but I did wanna delve more deeply in the Montgomery bus boycott. Why do you think of all of the places throughout the country that had emerged in uh, Montgomery? Well, uh, I have not thought this out very well. Um, but certainly I know that during the 1953-1973 uh, uh, nonviolent uh, struggle of America, um, I've discovered that, that, that somehow all the forces that permit a struggle for change come together in one place. Uh, uh, and I haven't thought this out very well at all. And I don't know what historian or philosopher has worked on this better than I have. But what I, let me see if I can describe what I mean. Uh, uh, in Montgomery, one of the streams of history that came to maturity was the fact that black women who had to ride the buses, whose major work in the Montgomery area was working in the homes of white people as uh, caregivers to children, as cooks, as maids in the household, as house, household cleaners, uh, uh, a, a wide variety of carrying on, excuse me, in white families um, work for which they were paid in the 1940s and early 50s, no more than a dollar, two dollars a day for eight or 10 hours of work. But among them was a fairly relatively smaller group of people who, and, who were antagonized by this treatment. Uh, some of them were um, um, the wives of doctors and business, black business people, and they would never ride the buses. But they helped to organize a women's political committee in Montgomery and, and as early as five years before 1955, they were writing letters to the mayor of Montgomery and to the bus company protesting that treatment. They even carried a delegation of women to meet with the bus company head and the mayor uh, to insist that this is atrocious treatment because the women oftentimes were mistreated by the white bus drivers who would cuss at them. The buses were made up in such a fashion that you paid your fare in, on the front door. Then you, a black person had to walk out of, back down out of the front door after having paid for the trip and go back down the side to the back door and enter to the back door in order to sit down. And, and any number of women had the experience of the bus driver taking the money in the front of the bus. And then as they are walking back to the back of the bus, leaving them in the street. 
So uh, that was one element that was important. Many women who were fed up with the mistreatment and with the segregation. When later Rosa Parks was arrested on December 1st, 1955, and people said she was coming home from work and she was tired. She said, I was not tired from coming home to work. I was tired of how they treated us. I was fed up with taking this kind of treatment on the bus. I'm so, so glad that you've always lifted up the extraordinary role of women in yeah. launching and leading mm -hmm. the Montgomery bus boycott, but also in dispelling that uh, uh, false rewriting of history that somehow uh, Rosa Parks was just tired. That day she just, you know, wasn't, Yes. <laughs> you know, that it was a spontaneous act of, uh, of civil disobedience or rebellion when in fact she was a leader of the NAACP. She had done training at the Highlander Center, uh, that she was a well-respected uh, community leader and that this was a very conscious and deliberate launch of a, um, of a, a nonviolent protest, a boycott of the Montgomery bus uh, system. So I do think that that uh, clarification of history uh, is so critical. Um, well, I think, I think also that, that it needs, needs further discussion because I think that Rosa Parks went to the Highlander Folk School in the summer or spring of 1955. It was her first experience of being with white people in a um, different setting and discovering that there were white people with the same sensibility about truth and justice that she had. Uh, and that was her first experience as a black woman. And I maintain that as she, experienced that together, the, especially the community living, eating at the same table, sharing the care of the tables and the cooking and all of that, that she discovered a steel in her own character, which said that the next time one of these incidents took place in Montgomery, when she was going to work and coming to work, she was gonna say no. I maintain that that's what happened, that that Highlander experience gave her a sense of character and power in which she determined that she would not just sit still on the next incident. Well, thank you also for lifting up the uh, role uh, of the Highlander Center, uh, where they were bringing uh, uh, a multiracial group of community leaders together uh, to learn, to study, uh, to uh, uh, engage in dialogue, to prepare or social movements. And that very act of bringing a multiracial group together was a violation of the law. Uh, and right. so that, that, that in and of itself was an act yeah. of civil disobedience. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, Highlander Folk School was a place where people could come, to, come together and talk together and be roommates in the same room at eat at the same table and all of that sort of stuff. And it was a, a cooperative center. And I maintain that it was more noteworthy in those days for being a center that broke the law <laughs> and gave a handful of white people and a handful of black people the opportunity to see, it, see each other face to face without fear, that that's the notable achievement uh, that took place out of Highland of Center. And, and it's very important, it seems to me, there, the, you know, the Rosa Parks went there. I, I was in Highlander, I'm not sure how many times, both in 58 and 59 and probably 60. But, but my first visit there, I know my first visit took place in the early part of 1958. One thing that you've uh, often stressed uh, through uh, this class is the protracted nature of nonviolent movements and nonviolent campaigns. And it is extraordinary that the Montgomery bus boycott lasted through four seasons, you know, over one year. Yeah. 
And I wanted to uh, ask in particular, the role of the black church in uh, su supporting, nurturing and sustaining this movement for over a year. Yes, well, you know, the, uh, a lot of time the revisionist history I hear is irrelevant <laughs> and it confuses the, a, a, a wonderful movement and a wonderful, wonderful organic evolutionary social development. Because some people look back and say, well, she, gee, the, all those ministers getting credit. Well, no, that wasn't the case. The Montgomery Bus Boy Court showed us a clear political social pattern that we could use for desegregating the nation and especially the Southeastern part of the nation. Number one, the black pastors were all men who pastored congregations of black people, became their preacher, teacher, example, became their organizer, became the person who helped them see issues. And one of the universal things about it is that almost invariably in those black churches, segregation was not seen as a friend to black people, but as a handicap. There were very few, if any, black preachers who did not denounce segregation. If they did not denounce segregation for its racism, it denounced segregation because it prevented black people from working in many, many areas of work for which many of them were qualified. <laughs> the prohibitions, the, the push of segre racial segregation to keep black folk poor and a source of cheap labor is one of the features that has to be understood. So black preachers, were in many instances, the freest human beings in Montgomery from the point of view of the fact that they, that they did a work that was totally dependent upon their relationship with their black congregation. They were not financially dependent upon the white community in any way. And they lived at a time where in fact, Few, if any, black people supported, especially any black preacher, supported segregation as a way of life. There were some who did. I know that from my experience of life, but few did this publicly. So what happened was, therefore, that this group of sophisticated Montgomery residents, black residents, when they met in the afternoon uh, to see how the one day of boycott had gone on and to see what the next steps was going to be, they of course had several ministers in the room and they elected Martin King as the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association, Ralph Abernathy as treasurer, I think, or vice president. Uh, and they uh, 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 nominated and elected four or five other preachers to the executive committee for the, to their then at in the two or three or four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock in the afternoon, deciding that they would let the mass meeting that night determine whether or not the people wanted to go on and continue the boycott. Uh, so the role of the black pre preacher was important because it, it, it helped them and the community to recognize that their black clergy could be leaders in a massive struggle to desegregate Montgomery buses. Also, they would became a major group of force raising money because many of the ones who participated in Montgomery in their Sunday morning services, they prayed for the bus boycott and they took up an offering for the Montgomery bus boycott. I mean, I hear about 
now black groups getting major grants of money, but in the 1955, it would have to be the black church as a major black institution of the city of Montgomery that would have to come together. And they may not have raised enough money or given enough money to finance the boycott, but they raised enough money to keep it alive and to keep it moving through 381 days. Uh, then a third thing that I would lift up is that it allowed Martin Luther King Jr. to say from the very beginning, we're going to do this the very first night of the mass meeting at Holt Street Baptist Church, which was surrounded by cars parked and people on the sidewalk. So Martin could not park. He had to park two or three blocks away from the church by the time he got there early. Um, uh, it it uh, 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 allowed Martin King to provide leadership from day one and to provide leadership from the nobility side of human struggle. That is that we are people of God, <laughs> we are meant to be, and we have a power to overcome evil, not with evil, but with good. So King, in his first few remarks to the crowd, said, we're going to do this out of Christian love. That in itself was an important thing, because the great neglect of so many power people in the power circles of our nation treat conflict not from the person, not from the view of the compassion, but from generally too often from a view of power or greed and domination. So King said, not only would do this out of love, but also we're not going to go downtown and drag white people out of their homes and beat up on them. This is the nature of racism. George Floyd, Minneapolis, not an incident. It's, it's the way of segregation and racism in this country. King said, we're not going to do that. He also said something else, that very critical. He said, we're not going to burn crosses on white people's homes. Now, the KKK is the agency that burned crosses, even in California. And they would cover with white hoods and go out and put a cross in front of a black home, try to scare the people with this burning cross. Well, King insists we're not going to follow the Ku Klux Klan behavior. We're not going to imitate the enemy. The, the proponents of racism. We're going to do it a, a different way. So uh, within the first eight weeks of the bus boycott, Martin King is not only pushing the Christian, uh, the, the Jesus in the Bible from a standpoint of political struggle and social struggle and personal redemption and healing uh, but he's also pushing it as a way of engendering power that can force segregation to decrease, to be dismantled. Uh, and, and that, I think, has to be understood, that uh, the, the emergence of pastors in city after city, in the southeastern part of the country especially, was the unique position that pastors had. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and also the power they could exercise because they were every week always before uh, the members of their congregation who were citizens of the community. And that role, I don't see that as a, uh, that status as being the only one, but I see it rather as a significant role in order to have a movement in the southeastern part of the country. And now we know from studies of a, a handful of black scholars, especially, that in over 200 cities in the Southeast, mid-sized, small, larger cities, there were such desegregation campaigns that used nonviolent struggle. And, and in fact, uh, uh, 
sought to imitate Montgomery, Alabama and later Nashville, Tennessee. Well, uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your reflections on the role of the black church as a, a powerful independent institution, as a, a meeting and gathering spot, as a place uh, that would generate uh, financial support for yeah. the Montgomery bus boycott and so many other uh, freedom struggles. Uh, and as you said, you know, where uh, 200 towns and cities uh, launched their own desegregation campaigns in large part because of the inspiration of Montgomery and of the Nashville uh, sit-in campaign that you helped to lead. Yes. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, once again, we see the power of um, institutions who are uh, transformed to engage in social justice and social change. Uh, and we see how social movements engender other social movements. Um, I did want to get back though to this whole notion because I think it's quite extraordinary that um, both you and Dr. King, uh, you know, young ministers uh, were not only uh, called, uh, not only were called to the um, pulpit, but you were also called to the philosophy of nonviolence. And so I, I wanted to uh, talk about that alignment, both uh, in terms of your um, religious beliefs, your religious convictions, uh, but also the deep conviction that you and Dr. King shared with regard to the philosophy of nonviolence. I, I think in both cases, it was a, a question of growing up in the black church. Um, in both our cases, our fathers were pastors. Um, pastors who, on the one side, insisted that the religion of Jesus did not support segregation and racism and poverty. <laughs> In some cases, it did not support violence. Uh, in, in, in one way, then, um, I do say, uh, and have said for a number of decades, then I really had no choice in the matter. That in some uh, mysterious, unknown fashion, um, the, the notion of wrestling against social evil through the lens of love became something that was at the very core of my life early on. And there was a specific example of it um, at in the in the spring of my fourth year of school, and we uh, at that time we were at the uh, Horseman Elementary School in Massillon, Ohio, where I grew up from age four. Um, I made a trip to town, which was three or four blocks to the main street for my mother after school. And on the street, I was challenged by racist epithets. I didn't know what the word epithet meant at that time. <laughs> but I hit the child two or three times and went on and ran the errand. And then when I got back home for the first time, my mother was still in the kitchen from which she had launched my errand. And she and I reported the errand uh, results and then mentioned the incident on Main Street. And my mother, without turning to me at all, um, continued to work at the stove where she was uh, obviously preparing our evening meal. She said quietly to me, Jimmy, what good did that do? And I'll never, I'll never forget that question. And she launched into a long soliloquy uh, about who we were and who I was and about Jesus as an example of life and about love and truth. Um, and 
that how much I was loved by my family and my church uh, and said, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, slapping the person uh, did not really effect any change. It only multiplied the problem. And then I'll never forget, as she finished that soliloquy, she, at, she said, and Jimmy, there must be a better way. She said, there must be a better way. And uh, I recognized that in my own life, she was saying, you, you have to get into the business of finding that better way. And she was saying to me, this may, this should become a part of the thing that you will do as a black boy in, in uh, Massillon, Ohio. Um, so uh, it, uh, I, I recognized at that time then that I would be on the one side asserting my humanity as a child. And my parents used to tell us to in the midst of prejudice and racism to be natural, be yourself, be, be alive, be caring and loving and do your work and all of that. So um, uh, in a very real way, I recognized I had no choice. On the one side, I had this racial prejudice and stuff against people that I heard and saw and so, and on the other side, I had to not, act, I had to not accept it as necessary for my life, but I had to resist it and fight it. But I had to do it in a way that would allow us to overcome it and not increase, increase it, but to overcome it. So in, in a real way, I see those experiences in my childhood as a direct path towards discovering in 1947 then more about Gandhi and to realize that Gandhi was in 47 precisely doing that. That's what's so remarkable in terms of uh, the bond that you shared with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not mm -hmm. only in terms of your uh, uh, role as uh, ministers, uh, your role as um, uh, faith-based leaders, but also your deep uh, conviction that nonviolence uh, was the uh, philosophy that mm -hmm. would help to uh, promote the type of um, comprehensive social change and social justice agenda that um, this country so desperately needs. Uh, and so I do think that uh, uh, that partnership, that uh, friendship that uh, emerged uh, was so decisive in uh, influencing the, the direction of the uh, freedom movement um, uh, that began in the South and that, that truly uh, swept through uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of towns and cities across the country. And, and, and Kent, to this day, I do remember uh, 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 that meaning because I, I started going into Birmingham, Alabama in 1906, in 1958. My, I landed in Nashville in January of 1958. And that first month I was in 10 or 15 other places. I met all of the Little Rock Nine. I think Little Rock was my first trip. Um, but I, I met Fred Shuttlesworth sometime in the same period. And I wanted to, in the Birmingham, therefore, um, uh, every year, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, I was in Birmingham doing the work of the struggle. And I'll never forget one of the times I was in Birmingham, I went to a revival meeting at night at the church of, one of my one of the pastors become my friend Nelson uh, Smith. I don't remember the name of the church, but he was a well-known 
preacher in the city and in Baptist circles in the country. And the preacher who opened up the meeting spoke on the rough places of religion. And he quoted Jesus, but he also insisted that if you, if, if, if when the path is smooth and easy, then to walk with God was an easy matter. But the real test was when the pathway was rough and raggedy and without a map. And you then have to go in. So he called it the rough places of religion. So I, I, I've always remembered that. I've never remember the name of the man, but the rough places. So in many places, black preachers interpret that enduring power, the fact that you must serve, persevere to overcome the evil with good. And in one way, that's out of the, out of religious faith, that comes, nonviolence comes as a national, as a, as a, not, as a, as a kind of mystical awareness that grabs hold of your mind and your spirit and your imagination, your work in ways that you really cannot describe. And one of the other things that I should say about this is that Gandhi said, you have to be a person of faith to do nonviolence. And all the world's great religions insist that compassion and truth and wonder and beauty are a part of the road you take to overcome wrong. All the world great, whether it's Buddhism or Judaism or Islam or Sikhism, uh, uh, the, the ancient literature often written in mythological terms, that literature, does and the people behind that literature in the final analysis insist that you cannot overcome wrong with wrong. You cannot change evil doing evil. And, and Gandhi again said it very well in some of his, uh, his writings when he says that you do an eye for an eye and everyone soon becomes blind. If you do a tooth for a tooth, then everyone becomes toothless. <laughs> so that, so the, the world's finest poetic philosophical writings all have in them the sensibility that you, you have to use justice to overcome injustice. And, and that's, that's one of the things that I like about the Montgomery bus boycott because the Montgomery uh, 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 Improvement Association Executive Committee invited the work of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So within a few days of the boycott, they were organizing a legal case to go to the courts that they hoped would go in fact to the Supreme Court. And that resulted in a unanimous Supreme Court decision that segregation, bus segregation in the city of Memphis was in the city of, of Montgomery was unconstitutional. It is after that decision came down that the bus boycott ended. And the Montgomery Improvement Association voted not only to end it, but then to go back on the buses in a desegregated way <laughs> and help to organize that. Well, that's a, a, a remarkable story. And uh, mm -hmm. the way you frame this, that, that love and justice and humanity uh, indeed can triumph over the forces of, uh, of uh, you know, racism and hate. Yep, and uh, mm -hmm. you know the power of the campaigns and the movements that you have led have uh, shown that uh, time and again. Um, for the last uh, remaining part of our conversation, I did want to uh, share another few photos. Uh, last uh, March, March of 2020, I had the privilege of uh, 
uh, traveling with you back to Montgomery, Alabama, uh, we brought a delegation of Los Angeles labor leaders who have worked with you for decades. Uh, and what was so exciting was it, it was a certain convergence of people who you have uh, uh, met with and worked with uh, in Los Angeles for uh, so many years, uh, reconnecting with um, uh, some of your roots as a uh, uh, social justice and social change leader um, in the South. So I wanted to uh, share some of these um, additional photos uh, of our trip from March of last year. And uh, this was uh, uh, the delegation that uh, uh, joined us. Uh, and uh, it was comprised of uh, a number of uh, key labor leaders of Los Angeles. We met with Brian Stevenson at the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, you had a powerful conversation with uh, Brian Stevenson. We've actually uh, recorded and taped uh, that conversation that will appear in an upcoming book on your uh, teachings of nonviolence that will be published by uh, the University of California Press. We visited the Freedom Ride Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, and uh, Dorothy Walker, the executive director, came out and she was so thrilled uh, that you were able to visit her museum. She said that the uh, people that you trained and developed through the Nashville sit-in campaign were the backbone of the Freedom Rides and that mm -hmm. the Freedom Ride Museum and the Freedom Ride movement would not exist without uh, the leadership that you uh, demonstrated and exhibited uh, during that uh, period. We also uh, went to Selma and uh, uh, you uh, marched across the Pettus Bridge uh, with your good friend, uh, John Lewis, surrounded by 20 members of Congress. And uh, uh, at the end of that march, John Lewis uh, gathered by hundreds of uh, uh, friends and allies and dozens of media began his remarks by saying that uh, he is so grateful to be with his good friend, Reverend Lawson. And his comment was, uh, it's been a while since we've marched across this bridge. You then gave a, a stirring um, sermon at the historic Brown Chapel in uh, Selma that was attended by more than 20 members of Congress. Um, Nancy Pelosi rushed up to you after your sermon and said, uh, you must come speak uh, before Congress. Uh, Congress needs your uh, moral clarity and needs your vision. And so uh, uh, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, was uh, thrilled to have this opportunity to hear from you and to meet with you. And uh, that same day, we had lunch with uh, uh, Kamala Harris, who uh, uh, was uh, uh, soliciting your advice for, um, uh, this was before she had uh, um, uh, declared uh, for her uh, vice presidential candidacy, uh, but mm -hmm. she very much uh, sought out uh, your advice in terms of uh, uh, her uh, uh, future political decisions and political moves. So, um, so that was a very, um, a fortuitous gathering in March yes. of 2020. Yes. Yes. And uh, I just wanted you to uh, share some of your reflections about uh, that uh, uh, last uh, meeting that you had with uh, your good friend, uh, Congressman John Lewis, and uh, uh, your um, uh, ability to connect with so many people that you had worked with for so many years uh, in the South. Yes, and 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 that that actually was uh, the last time then that uh, John Lewis and I uh, were in the same space anywhere. I think that's right. Um, in, indeed, uh, yeah, it was quite a notable event. And walking in places where we had walked before in the struggle was uh, very very important to me. Um, yeah, it seems to me that that on, on that particular occasion, I was uh, in a way quite blessed uh, with the fact that uh, I had begun teaching from 1958 and counseling all across the South. And uh, Congressman John Lewis and I met when he was about 18 or 19 because he came to Nashville to study at American Baptist College. 
And uh, one of his teachers and friend was Kelly Miller Smith, who had taken a course at Harvard, at Howard University from William Stuart Nelson, who had spent some time in India looking at Gandhi and the freedom movement and, would, and was teaching in the School of Religion in Washington, D.C. at Howard and teaching nonviolent struggle as being a very relevant way of working on segregation and racism in the United States. Uh, and so it's, it's Kelly Miller Smith who in fact uh, recruited John Lewis to come to our 1959 workshops on nonviolence as we organized the campaign to desegregate downtown Nashville. Now that's, that's a critical, critical moment. I don't think it's in the history books, but it's in my life. Montgomery did begin the introduction of desegregation of downtown in the Montgomery bus boycott. Nashville then 1959 insisted that's where we would start our work. Remember many places in the South had these horrible signs that people lived with. White only restrooms, water fountains that were marked colored only, white only in the same department store. Um, people living under the what signs were immoral and you know as I look back upon it now I don't remember ever having seen in the 40s or 50s or 60s a single crusade against those signs <laughs> this is how public segregation was insured and became a horror to many people then the other part of it is that sometimes without the signs, the, a black traveler or a black person living in Montgomery, Alabama did not know when and where he might face a very threatening and hostile moment without warning. Uh, so as I traveled the nation in the Midwest and in the East Coast and even in the South, I had incidents where I was where I was supposed to be, but faced refusal, for example, of a hotel in Washington, D.C., where I was coming to a meeting representing United Methodist Church young people and students, had my certificate of of registration and my registration for the hotel and the hotel tells me they can't take me in because they've sold all their rooms for the night. So that kind of incident could happen anywhere. And it happened to me in Detroit, in my hometown of Maslin, in Peoria, Illinois. I don't know how many other places, Indianapolis and the, Indiana. <laughs> so uh, the, the, the signs were located largely in uh, all across the Southeast and many parts of the South Central, uh, but they were more erratic outside the South and the South Central. Uh, but the hostility of you going into that drugstore was present and you could be accosted for no reason other than the fact that you were black. Uh, so uh, it, uh, uh, it was an immoral period of time in the United States because the governments said almost nothing against such immoral signs, compounded by the fact that so many officials in the United States took 
great pride in calling the United States a democracy because of our historical documents. <laughs> the historical documents which we did not try to program in the daily life of the nation. Um, On that note, uh, this is a good time for us to conclude. Um, I'm so glad that you uh, drew out the connection between uh, Montgomery and Nashville, because next week we will be joined by Angeline Butler, one of the leaders of the Nashville sit-in movement, who is currently a professor at John Jay College in Brooklyn. Uh, so um, thank you so much for joining us this week uh, on our conversation on the Mon Montgomery bus boycott. Please join us next week when we will be uh, discussing the Nashville sit-in campaign. Mm -hmm.